Good morning, everyone. I'm Lillian Duong, Outreach Strategist at the California Budget and Policy Center. I'm so excited to welcome you to our first Empower event of the year, Understanding Governor Newsom's 2023 to 2024 state budget proposal. As you all know, the governor has released his budget for a year that is anticipated to have economic challenges and uncertainties. Even so, it's imperative that we ensure all Californians have the critical support and services they need to weather this hardship. I hope you'll walk away from today's webinar empowered with the information you need to advance smart policy choices and public investments. Our, our event today is part of our event series, Empower, People Policy Progress. This is a free public education resource that is made possible by our event sponsors, Blue Shield of California Foundation, Heising Simons Foundation, James Irvine Foundation, and by viewers like you. You can donate and support programs like the one today by going on our website at calbudgetcenter.org. We also are able to provide live captioning services for those who'd like it. And you can access them by going on the closed caption button on the YouTube video. Now, for today's agenda, I'll be joined by four of my wonky colleagues, Adriana Ramos Yamamoto, Alyssa Anderson, Monica Davlos, and Kayla Kitson. Since we only have an hour for today's webinar, they'll be writing a high level overview of the state budget in several key areas, economic security and safety net programs, proposals supporting workers and the workforce, health, housing, and homelessness, and last but not least, K-12 and higher education. You can find more information and details on the state budget by going on our website and looking for our first look publication. After what will be undoubtedly great presentations, Adriana is going to be moderating a live Q&A session where we'll be taking audience questions. So please submit your questions in the YouTube comment section at any point during the webinar. Now, without further ado, I will be handing things over to Adriana to get us started with a snapshot of the overall state budget. Thriving families, strong communities, a vibrant state. The state budget is the pathway to building a just and equitable California. By making sure that we can all engage in meaningful conversations and strategic decisions, our budget and policies can better reflect California's values. That's why my colleagues and I are here today to talk about the proposed 2023-24 state budget and what it means for Californians. The governor's budget proposal mostly protects progress made in recent years to improve economic security for Californians with low incomes, such as Medi-Cal expansion and investments in affordable housing. However, state leaders should explore pathways to better meet the needs of Californians, particularly Black, Latinx, and other Californians of color and people with low incomes, as they continue to experience the rising costs of food, housing, and other necessities. I'm going to start us off with a high-level overview of the state budget. The three things I'm going to talk about are our state revenues, our state reserves, and what state leaders can do to better support Californians. This overview, overview will provide context for the proposals that my colleagues are going to discuss. So let's dive in and talk about revenues first. The administration projects that general fund revenues for the three-year budget window ending with the 2023-24 fiscal year will be $29.5 billion lower than estimated in the 2022 Budget Act. This slide here shows the state's major revenue sources for the three-year budget window, which are projected to be down by $25.4 billion for the personal income tax, $3.8 billion for the corporation tax, 
and $2.5 billion for the sales and use tax. This estimate of the state's revenue largely reflects a decline in the personal income tax, which is consistent with slowing economic growth and a weaker stock market. The revenue forecast does not anticipate that the economy falls into a recession. If that happens, the administration estimates that revenue losses could range from $20 billion to $60 billion greater, depending on the severity of the recession. I also want to mention that the administration expects federal funding for emergencies like wildfires and COVID-19 to be $6.9 billion lower than estimated in the 2022 Budget Act. Another important thing to talk about in understanding our state's budget are the state's reserves. What are they meant to be used for and what role would they play in this proposed budget? California has a number of state reserve accounts that set aside funds intended to be used for a rainy day when economic conditions worsen and state revenues decline. This slide sh here shows the balance for the budget stabilization account, the safety net reserve, the public school system stabilization account, and the special fund for economic uncertainties. The projected total for these accounts is $35.6 billion. The governor's proposal does not use state's reserves to close the anticipated budget shortfall. State leaders should be cautious about using reserves during a period of economic uncertainty, but using a portion of reserves during this window of declining state revenues may also be appropriate. Which brings me to my final point. State leaders have a range of tools they can use to make sure that all Californians can thrive. First and foremost, the legislature and administration should reconsider tax breaks for corporations and the wealthy, such as the governor's proposal to extend the film tax credit. Let's unpack this a little bit. It's important to note that California spends more than $70 billion on tax breaks each year, many of which benefit corporations and people with, low, people with high incomes. This spending is on autopilot for the most part and is not reviewed each year as part of the budget process. That means policymakers aren't able to choose between maintaining tax breaks for corporations or investing in vital services that help all Californians thrive. Another tool in the toolbox are the state's reserves, which I already talked a little bit about. In the event of budget shortfalls, state leaders can use a portion of the reserves to ensure that essential services can be provided to Californians. Lastly, the legislature should consider closing additional state prisons because that frees up dollars that could be redirected to help people transition back into their communities. So we talked about revenues for the upcoming year, existing state reserves, and what state leaders can do to better support Californians. My hope is that you have context for the proposals that my colleagues are going to discuss. To recap, the governor's budget proposal largely protects recent investments in essential supports for millions of Californians who have been left out of our state's great wealth. However, policymakers need to explore pathways to build upon these investments to better meet the, meet the needs of millions of Californians, uh, particularly Black, Latinx, and other Californians of color, and Californians with low incomes. With that, I'd now like to hand it over to Alyssa to talk about economic security proposals. Alyssa? Great, thank you so much, Adriana. Um, so I'm gonna talk about major safety net programs, uh, which we know are vital because every Californian deserves to be able to put food on the table, keep a roof over their head and provide for their families. Uh, but we also know that millions of people all throughout California are struggling to make ends meet and they really need a stronger safety net. Um, fortunately, the governor's budget does protect core safety net programs, but there's nothing that really further strengthens the safety net. And this comes at a time when things are likely to get uh, much more difficult for a lot of people. So for example, in terms of CalFresh food assistance, millions of Californians are about to face a real crisis because Congress ended emergency food benefits that have been a lifeline for a lot of people since the beginning of the pandemic. Uh, we're talking about a loss of $500 million in food benefits a month starting in March. 
Uh, unfortunately, the governor's budget doesn't include any additional assistance to help people cope with that loss. The budget also doesn't further expand food benefits for undocumented Californians. People under age 55 remain excluded. And while the state has previously committed to expanding food benefits to people age 55 and older, uh, that won't go into effect until 2027, which is much later than many had hoped. Um, one bright spot in the budget, however, is that there is funding to improve security features for CalFresh and CalWORKs EBT cards, and that's going to help protect people's benefits from theft, which has been on the rise recently. Uh, turning now to SSI SSP, which provides cash grants to over a million low income seniors and people with disabilities. The governor proposes increasing the state portion of these grants for the third year in a row, um, although not quite as much as previously committed to. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, and while these increases are meaningful, they're well below what's needed to fully make up for the very large cuts that were made over a decade ago. And so that leaves a lot of low income seniors and people with disabilities less able to make ends meet. Uh, in terms of CalWORKs, which provides cash support and services to families with low incomes, particularly families of color who've been blocked from economic security because of discrimination and racist and sexist policies, the budget includes a modest 2.9% increase in cash grants. Uh, that's required by law. Local revenue growth, growth automatically tri uh, triggers grant increases. But some CalWORKs families still receive grants that are below half the poverty line. Um, and while last year's budget did provide very sizable grant increases, it's important to remember that those increases are not permanent. They're contingent upon the state having enough revenue to cover the ongoing cost. Uh, and remember, under the governor's projections, the state will continue to face budget shortfalls over the next few years. So I think this gets back to the earlier point that um, Adriana made uh, that, you know, State leaders really need to start reevaluating costly tax breaks for corporations and the wealthy because California does have the resources to uh, make sure that all people in our state can thrive. Uh, we just need to tap into them. Finally, turning to refundable tax credits, the Cali ITC, Young Child Tax Credit, and the new Foster Youth Tax Credit collectively help millions of Californians with low incomes pay for basic needs like food. And uh, on the upside, the budget does maintain funding to help connect people to those credits and to free tax prep services, but the budget doesn't make any additional investments in those tax credits, um, which are really needed now more than ever because Congress uh, failed to reinstate that very big expansion of the federal child tax credit and the federal EITC. Um, so briefly summing up again, the governor's budget does protect core safety net programs, which is commendable, but to build on recent progress and to actually create a state where all people can thrive, state leaders, again, really need to take a hard look at all that spending that happens through the state tax code to the benefit of corporations and the wealthy. Uh, and with that, I'll turn it over to Kayla to talk about proposals affecting workers. Thanks so much, Alyssa. So this is an area where there are really a little bit more missed opportunities than actual proposals. So we know that the state has, is in a better position now in terms of having recovered the jobs that were lost during the pandemic. But of course, we know that many Californians always face obstacles to attaining stable, well-paying employment, and they need supports to allow them to both participate in the workforce and to be able to be economically secure during periods when they can't work. So one critical need for workers with children, of course, is affordable childcare. While the governor's proposal does maintain the more than 100,000 additional subsidized childcare slots that were added over the last two budgets, it's now proposing to delay the addition of another 20,000 slots that were planned for the upcoming fiscal year into the following fiscal year, or 2024-25. And the governor does note that many of the recently created slots have not yet actually been filled. So also in the area of childcare, the proposal does not include any uh, rate increases for subsidized childcare providers, even though these payment rates haven't been keeping up with increases in the minimum wage and increases in other costs of providing care. The uh, <clears throat> Another issue is that the 
fees that families have to pay to access subsidized childcare can be unaffordable for many lower income families. And the waiver of, of family fees that was put into place during the pandemic is set to expire in June. And the governor is not proposing to extend that at this time. Another critical support for workers is the ability to take paid time off when they're sick or a family member is sick. And while the state had temporarily increased the amount of paid sick time that employers are uh, required to provide from three days to two weeks, that policy expired at the end of 2022. And again, the governor is not proposing to reinstate this policy. So that means that many workers will now only have three paid sick days for the entire year, which could leave them with the choice of going to work sick or losing part of their paycheck or even their job. And of course, when workers lose, lose their jobs altogether, many of them are able to receive unemployment benefits to replace some of their lost wages and make ends meet while they look for another job. Unfortunately, Californians who are undocumented are excluded from the unemployment insurance system, even though we know they make substantial contributions to the state's economy, and of course should never be faced with financial devastation after being laid off. And unfortunately, the governor does not propose any um, additional support for these Californians who are excluded from that uh, critical safety net program. And finally, in the area of workforce development programs, the governor does propose a series of funding cuts or delays. Uh, and these include, but are not limited to, a $50 million cut over four years to public health workforce programs, the elimination of $25 million in funding for the upcoming budget year for the COVID workplace outreach program, a $40 million cut over two years to fund um, non-traditional apprenticeship programs, the pausing of a funding commitment for $30 million over two years to create a women in construction unit at the Department of Industrial Relations, which would aim to support women and non-binary people in the skilled trades, and $20 million cut over two years to two different programs, uh, emergency medical technician training and the California Youth Leadership Program. So as in some areas of some other areas of the budget, some of these cuts may be restored if there are sufficient funds in January 2024. But if revenues don't look up by then, all of these cuts would remain in place. One area where the governor does propose an additional investment in workforce development is to make the Youth Job Corps program permanent, and he would provide $78 million ongoing for this. This is a program that aims to connect underserved youth and young adults with careers in, in certain public services and then to provide wraparound services to support them. The budget proposal does note an intent to reach undocumented Californians with work authorization, so presumably DACA recipients uh, with this program, but we don't have additional details uh, on that piece at this time. So with that, I will pass it over to Monica to talk about health, housing, and homelessness proposals. Yeah, thank you, Kayla. Um, so I will be going. Oh, I'll be going over some of the budget highlights in regards to health, housing, and homelessness. Respective to health, we know that access to timely, quality, and comprehensive health care is deeply important for all Californians which is why it was good to see that the proposed budget does protect major healthcare investments that were previously allocated in last year's budget. Most notably, um, the budget maintains commitment to expand Medi-Cal coverage to qualifying undocumented Californians ages 26 to 49, beginning January 2024, which closes the remaining eligibility gap. This expansion is, ex is estimated to cost a little over $840 million in 2023-24, with rising ongoing costs. The governor's budget also reflects a commitment to preserving funding to support Californians' mental health and well-being. In recent years, the administration has launched various behavioral health initiatives to improve behavioral health services across the state. And this year, they'll be seeking approval for a new federal federal waiver called California's Behavioral Health Community-Based Continuum Demonstration. And while that's a mouthful, uh, it's really meant to complement and build on existing behavioral health initiatives, and it's estimated to cost a little over $6 billion over five years. 
And so in regards to housing, um, we all know that the state's ongoing housing affordability challenges is one of the most pressing issues we're all currently facing. And there are deep equity implications as it disproportionately impacts California renters, especially Californians of color and those with low incomes who are struggling the most to meet housing costs, um, as you can see in the chart that's on our slide. Uh, overall, though, the governor does not propose new investments to expand affordable housing development, but does largely maintain previously promised funds. And this includes allocations for various programs that help build affordable housing, such as the Low Income Housing Tax Credit, the, multi, the Multifamily Housing Program, among others. There's also 350 million in trigger cuts that could be restored if sufficient general fund is available in January, 2024. Uh, this specifically includes 300 million for home ownership related programs that are targeted for low and middle income Californians, as well as an additional 50 million for the Cal HFA accessory dwelling unit program. And the last thing I wanted to highlight is that the governor missed the opportunity to include new funding to replace Proposition 1 bond funds that are expected to, ex to, that are expected to be exhausted this spring. And these are very important because they support the development of affordable multifamily housing. So lastly, moving on to homelessness. We know that having access uh, to, to a safe and stable place to call home is the most basic foundation for health and well-being, no matter one's age, gender, race, or ability. Yet over 170,000 Californians were counted as experiencing homelessness at the last point in time count, which is normally considered an undercount um, since this number doesn't capture people who fall in and out of homelessness throughout the year. And as with housing, there are deep rooted inequities that have placed BIPOC and LGBTQ plus individuals, as well as older adults and adults without children at higher risk of experiencing homelessness within their lifetimes. And while the budget does maintain earlier funding commitments to address homelessness, the proposed budget did not include new substantial funding. Instead, the administration is primarily focused on establishing stronger accountability measures within existing homelessness funding mechanisms. And with that said, some of those maintained allocations include the 1 billion general fund for the Homeless Housing Assistance and Prevention Grant Program, otherwise known as HAP, and these funds provide local jurisdictions with flexible funds to address homelessness tailored to their community needs. There's also 400 million for encampment resolution grants and 250 million for the Behavioral Health Bridge Housing Program, which supports people experiencing homelessness with serious behavioral health conditions through short-term housing and services. Although it's important to note that this amount actually reflects a $250 million reduction from the 2022 enacted budget. And this is proposed to be reallocated in the 2024-25 fiscal year. We also saw some new investments that deeply acknowledge the interlinked role that health and homelessness play. And that would leverage Medicaid funds if select waivers are approved by the federal government. And these proposals could provide temporary rental or housing assistance to certain at risk or actively unhoused individuals and people with serious behavioral health conditions. And the last thing I wanted to highlight is that the administration is moving forward with the Community Assistance Recovery and Empowerment Act, which would establish the care court system statewide. Starting in October, select counties will provide unhoused or at risk of becoming unhoused Californians with untreated schizophrenia spectrum or other psychotic disorders with a court ordered mandated treatment plan that includes behavioral health treatment, housing and other services. And this framework is expected or will be implemented statewide by December 2024. And this is actually one area where we did see some augmentations in the proposed budget, uh, specifically for county behavioral health department costs and to support legal counsel services for care participants. Um, that's expected to be provided by both public defenders or other legal service organizations. And it also adjusted the allocations to the judicial branch for CARE Act cost as the courts will be playing a critical role. And for specific figures, you can find those in the homelessness section of our first look. 
And with that, I'll now pass it over again to Kayla, who will be going over what we saw in the education realm. Thanks, Monica. So I'll cover both uh, pre-K to 12 and then higher education. And there's quite a bit to cover here. So I'll start with the big picture of Proposition 98 funding. Of course, Proposition 98 is the state's constitutional minimum funding guarantee for K-14 education. The administration is estimating a Prop 98 funding level for the upcoming budget year of $108.8 billion. Due to the declines in general fund revenue estimates that Adriana talked about earlier, the estimated Prop 98 levels for both the upcoming fiscal year and the current fiscal year have been revised down from the, the estimates in last year's Budget Act. However, even though the overall guarantee is down, the budget does include some funding increases in some education areas, which are made possible by the expiration of some one-time funding and lower than expected program costs in certain areas. So the funding for 23-24, the upcoming uh, budget year, does include $850 million to continue the expansion of transitional kindergarten, or TK. Um, and that funding also includes adding another staff person into TK classrooms. The expansion for the upcoming fiscal year would extend eligibility to children turning five between September 2nd and April 2nd, or about 46,000 additional children. And then the expansion to all four-year-olds is still expected to happen in the 2025-26 fiscal year. The proposed budget does include a pretty large cost of living adjustment, or COLA, of 8.13% for the state preschool program, the local control funding formula, or LCFF, and some categorical programs that are outside of the LCFF. Uh, which are which include but are not limited to special education, child nutrition, and American Indian education centers. So this COLA translates to an increase of more than $4 billion for the LCFF, and then about $670 million for categorical programs and $175 million for the state preschool program. Now it's important to note that part of this increase does appear to be paid for by cutting about $1.2 billion from a discretionary block grant that was included in last year's budget. So it is unclear how this increase would be funded on an ongoing basis since that block grant was one-time funding. One new thing that the governor is proposing is to create an what he calls an equity multiplier that would be added on to the LCFF to provide additional funds targeted to the highest need schools. And he includes uh, $300 million for this proposal. The Department of Finance has indicated that those funds would be targeted to schools based on the percentage of students that are eligible for free school meals, but uh, specific language on how that would work is still forthcoming. Another couple of areas of funding increases are a proposal to add $250 million in one-time funding for literacy programs in high-poverty schools and $100 million for uh, one-time funding for cultural enrichment activities for high school seniors. And in the area of pre-K to 12, the governor is proposing some cost reductions by delaying previously committed spending for preschool and school facilities. So now moving on to higher education, that 8.13% COLA also applies to California's community colleges, and that results in an increase of about $680 million. The governor is also proposing $92.5 million for um, categorical programs and the adult education program to provide that same COLA of 8.13% to those programs. The proposal is also including a third year of one-time funding to increase enrollment and retention at community colleges, since we've seen a decline in enrollment since the beginning of the pandemic. Moving on to the state's university systems, the CSU and the UC, the proposal includes a 5% base increase for both of these systems, which translates to an increase of $227 million for the CSU and $215.5 million for the UC. And those increases are part of multi-year investments that are intended to increase access, equity, affordability, and workforce preparedness. 
And finally, the budget maintains a previous commitment to increase funding for the middle class scholarship program by $227 million. And that's to provide student aid for CSU and UC students. And as we saw in the pre-K to 12 space, the proposal does include um, some funding off offsets by delaying the previously committed facilities funding and delaying a significant amount of previously planned funding for student housing. And you can find more details of those delays and the amounts in our first look write-up of the governor's proposal. Great, thank you, Kayla. So uh, that wraps up our presentation on the governor's proposed budget. I'd now like to invite Monica, Alyssa, and Kayla back to the virtual stage for Q&A, which is the most fun part of this webinar. Uh, I will be your moderator for this part of the webinar. We have actually quite a lot of time. We're, we're a bit ahead of time um, for questions. So to everyone watching right now, this is your opportunity to ask us questions in the chat. Um, but I'd like to start us off with a question about missed opportunities. So Kayla, let's start with you and then others can chime in. What are some missed opportunities or other budget items that you would like to highlight? Good question, Adriana. Uh, so I did mention some of the missed opportunities in the workforce development space, but um, this is a, this, I'd like to go back to a point that you made earlier, Adriana and, and Alyssa also touched on that I just want to reiterate that California is foregoing more than $70 billion a year to tax breaks for individuals and corporations. And while some of those tax breaks do benefit people with low and middle incomes, many of the really costly tax breaks do disproportionately benefit wealthy individuals and corporations. And again, this spending through the tax code doesn't get evaluated as part of the annual budget process. Even though those tax breaks do represent dollars that are being taken off the table, that could have been used to support Californians that are struggling with the cost of living. So in a time when revenues are looking down and we know Californians are struggling, the governor is considering funding cuts in certain areas. I would say that policymakers should, should, should also take a hard look at these tax breaks and consider cutting back those tax benefits that um, primarily benefit wealthy people and corporations to free up revenue that can be used to protect and strengthen supports for people with lower incomes and communities of color who are often the most harmed by spending cuts. Sorry, and if I could jump in as well. Um, I just wanted to highlight a missed opportunity in the health space, um, and that is the lack of assistance to help Californians purchase healthcare coverage through Covered California. The administration plans to transfer funds from the Healthcare Affordability Reserve Fund to the General Fund, and this revenue comes from the comes from the state's individual mandate penalty, and it's really specifically intended to help lower the cost of care in covered California. And state sh state leaders should really be using these dollars to provide more financial assistance to Californians who are uninsured or really struggling to purchase healthcare coverage through covered California, given that premiums, deductibles, and other out-of-pocket costs have been on the rise. Um, and I can add something too and take this question in a little bit of a different direction, because uh, I'd like to highlight a place where I think the governor makes a really smart choice. Uh, he's decided not to move forward with a $750 million optional payment on federal unemployment insurance loans. Um, these were loans that the state took out in order to fund un un unemployment benefits throughout the pandemic. Um, this payment is not required. It's optional. And there'd be no immediate benefit to workers or to businesses um, if this payment were made. Um, it's not even clear if there'd be any benefit to workers or businesses. So this is a really logical place for the state to scale back spending in order to protect critical services. Um, and we'd even argue that even if the state weren't facing um, a budget shortfall, it wouldn't make sense to make this payment because there's already a sensible payment plan in place under federal law. Um, so there's really no reason to waste millions of dollars when there are pressing needs in our communities and that money could be better spent uh, meeting those needs. And um, if you don't know much about this issue, we've written about it there. We have resources on our website if you'd like to learn more. 
Great. Thank you so much, Alyssa, Monica, and Kayla for highlighting some areas in the budget that maybe we weren't able to cover in our overview of the proposed budget. So I do see a question that came up in the chat um, around continuous eligibility for children until age five. Does that remain? Now for people who need a little bit of a, um, some background information or maybe a refresher on this proposal, um, so during the uh, pandemic, there was a temporary um, continuous coverage federal provision, which basically allowed states to receive enhanced federal funding um, in order to keep everyone uh, on their Medicaid programs. Uh, so it, it uh, went away with any like administrative renewals that had to happen. Um, and millions of people were able to keep their coverage, including in California. Millions of people have been able to uh, keep their Medi-Cal coverage. Um, that's all going to essentially um, start to go away. And the federal funding for that is going to wind down um, beginning April 1st of this year. And so um, really in anticipation for the unwinding of this public health emergency, advocates uh, last year were able to um, essentially get a commitment to make sure that we keep this really good policy, um, especially for children from birth up to age five, because consistent access to health care is really, really important, um, not just for kids, but for everybody to be healthy and thrive. But it allows um, young children to receive uh, preventive and primary care, which is very, very um, critical for their health and development. So advocates, again, were able to um, get a commitment. Uh, they weren't able to get funding last in last year's budget. Um, and I'd actually like to uh, pass it off to Alyssa to explain a little bit about um, trigger restorations, because I know that this came up um, in a recent LAO report. Um, so I'll, instead of Instead of botching <laughs> the response to, to that second part of your question, um, I'll go ahead and, and um, pass it off to Alyssa to, to help us understand what trigger restorations mean. Sure. Yeah. So actually, I'm going to say there are two different things to keep your eye on. One are the trigger investments that were part of last year's budget. Um, these were things that were specifically outlined as um, top priorities. Uh, for future budgets where money would be spent on certain things, including the CalWORKs grants, uh, the maintaining the increase in CalWORKs grants that I mentioned in my presentation. Um, but it's all contingent upon there being enough revenue to, to fund those things. Um, there's a really nice table in, a, in an LAO report, I can't remember which one, that outlines those trigger investments um, that maybe we can share on, on um, Twitter. Uh, after this presentation. So there's trigger investments from last year. And then in the governor's proposed budget this year, there are things that I believe he's calling trigger restorations. And so those are proposals where he has proposed cutting certain things, but um, he's proposing that those cuts be restored if there are sufficient revenues. So we've got two sort of, um, two sort of triggers that, that we might want to keep our eye on um, and watch for what gets you know restored and whether there'll be further investments in certain things um, in, in future budget years. I hope that was helpful and not and not more confusing. <laughs> <laughs> no, you explained it far better than I could. So thank you for your um, really helpful explanation on that. And again, we could share with you um, the LAO report as well as other resources for anybody who is interested in seeing those. Okay, I do see another question here about using the reserves. So what are the laws or rules governing how or uh, when we can use the reserves? Alyssa or Kayla, do one of you want to take a stab at that one? Yeah, sure, I'll chime in. So the state has several different reserves, as I think Adriana outlined earlier. The main state rainy day fund is called the budget stabilization account. And that was um, that there are laws in the constitution around that that uh, were approved via prop two in 2014, I believe. So there are certain instances when policymakers can actually draw down on that reserve. And first the governor would have to declare uh, a budget emergency. Uh, and that could either be 
as a result of some kind of natural disaster, so th that kind of emergency, or um, it could be a budget emergency, which is when the state doesn't have enough resources to meet the highest level of funding of the last three years. So I believe the governor could have declared a, bu a budget emergency for this year, but he has not. Uh, if he were to, the there is a limit to the amount that the state could actually draw down in a given year. So it would be the lower of half of the balance of the, the, the budget stabilization account or the amount needed to, to meet that highest level of funding over um, the past three years. The other reserves have different rules. The safety net reserve, which is intended to support um, safety net programs, Medicaid um, and CalWORK specifically, um, that it can basically be used at lawmakers' discretion. And there's a whole different set of rules for the state's um, the K-12 budget reserve, which I won't go into because I don't have my head fully wrapped around them. But if you are interested in that, you can reach out to our um, senior policy analyst for K-12 education, um, Jonathan Kaplan. Um, there are certain instances where the, um, the state would actually have to draw down on that reserve. So that, that there's some different rules there. Um, so I hope that was helpful. That was great, Kayla. Uh, I'm so glad you took that because you know the details. Um, and uh, I'm just going to add a little bit. I think we're probably going to be uh, publishing something on state reserves, sort of how much is in each reserve and when, what the rules are, when they can be drawn down. So definitely something to watch for because this is going to be, I think, uh, a key issue that's going to be discussed um, uh, this year. And um, just kind of going back to, I think, what you teed up really nicely at the beginning, Adriana, is that um, we can use state reserves. You know, they're there to help when there's a budget shortfall and, and, and really to protect vital services. Um, the tricky part is sort of how much do you, how much do you use, right? And, and we're in such um, uncertain economic times. Yeah, it's, it's gonna be challenging, but it's, it's really important to remember that they can be tapped into if needed. Yes, absolutely. Thank you, Kayla and Alyssa, for sharing some information about the state reserves. Uh, I see another question. Monica, this might be a good one for you. Uh, the question is, is there any relief for tenants or landlords as the eviction moratorium ends? Uh, yeah, that's a great question. Um, so two things. The, the state level um, eviction moratorium actually expired in the summer of last year, but there are some localities that have their own moratoriums that are expected to be expired soon. Um, but the budget doesn't include any specific funding um, that would, you know, provi that pr specifically provides rental assistance or any type of relief to renters or uh, landlords, um, which is why, right, kind of going back to our affordable housing and homelessness sections, it's really important um, to potentially see some augmented investments hopefully in the future and within those areas. Great. Thank you so much, Monica. And uh, I see another question. Maybe you can also uh, take this one or maybe others. Uh, there seems to be some confusion on the state's plans to close another state prison. Is that still part of the budget plan? Yes. <laughs> so uh, the governor's proposed budget does actually um, include a previously announced plan to reduce prison capacity, close a state-owned prison, and cease operation of a private prison, all of which, you know, actually generate, generate general fund savings. Um, and it's really worth noting that in recent years, the state has actually already closed one prison and is actually still in the process of closing another one. Uh, however, this process is still relatively slow moving, especially considering that a recent report released by the Legislative Analyst Office stated that California can safely close up to five prisons. Um, so state policymakers should really be planning to close even more prisons um, in the coming years, given that the additional savings from these closures could be redirected to help people make the transition back into the communities and boost services to survivors of crime. Yes, absolutely. Another tool in the toolbox that state policymakers can use to make sure that we're really investing in um, the supports that make sure that all Californians can thrive. So thank you for sharing more information about um, that proposal. Uh, let's see. These are some really great questions. Um, I see another one. 
Um, Kayla, maybe I'll ask you to, to share, and Alyssa, if you had any, anything to add. The question is, can you uplift re or rename wealthy slash corporate tax cuts or other proposals that advocates could target to free up funds for other priorities? I mean, where do I start? Um, <laughs> there, there are a lot, and I don't want to get into too much detail because it gets really wonky really quickly. Um, we do have a couple of reports up on our website that that go through a lot of the the particularly um, egregious tax breaks or the ones that are um, particularly uh, skewed towards the wealthy. Um, on the individual side, basically. You know, any of the itemized tax de um, deductions that can only be claimed by people who itemize their taxes, who tend to have um, higher incomes, um, those while while they provide some benefits to, to probably middle um, middle income folks, they do disproportionately benefit people with higher incomes. So there's a lot of places where, you know, we wouldn't necessarily say, like, get rid of that tax break completely. But there are a lot of things that you could do to, to target it more appropriately. So it's not just a giveaway to, to higher income folks. Um, uh, you know, the mortgage interest deduction is, is always an example that we like to bring up because it, you know, primarily benefits wealthier homeowners. Um, you know, it's a, it's a politically challenging one, but it, it's one that should always be, be brought up as something that, you know, doesn't really achieve the purpose that it was, um, which is also allowed for vacation homes. Um, you know, lawmakers have tried to get rid of just that, the tax break for second homes in recent years and have not been successful. Um, so, you know, that's that's one area. On the corporate side, there are a lot of things that, that could be paired back, like the research and development credit, you know, may have some, some benefits, but it's, um, there, there are billions of dollars in unused tax credits that uh, corporations have claimed but not used. So there are ways that we could pair it back because it's clearly not really providing an incentive to, to research and development. Um, and there's also a thing called the Water's Edge tax <laughs> election, which I won't go into the details of, but it is one of the largest tax breaks on the corporate side. And um, kind of encourages wealthy corporations that operate um, in multiple nations to, to shift their income abroad to avoid taxes in the U.S. and in California. So I'll stop there, and I probably already said too much. <laughs> Can I just add one thing? And it's very high level. I think you did a great job with all the details. That's very helpful. And, and definitely check out um, Kayla's reports. We actually have a data hit up on our website that's brand new. Um, uh, that Jonathan Kaplan on our team just recently published that uh, I'd really encourage you to check out. It shows that uh, today corporations pay half as much in their California profits, uh, of their California profits in state taxes as they did uh, a generation ago. Um, that's due to a lot of these tax breaks that Kayla just mentioned. And remember, every dollar that is spent on a corporate tax break is a dollar that could have been spent you know, helping Californians afford healthcare, childcare, housing, and strengthening the safety net. So just wanted to add that. And, and um, I can't get to it fast enough to put it on Twitter, but I'm sure someone will and we'll do it after the presentation. Yes, thank you, Alyssa and Kayla for sharing some information about um, corporate tax cuts. And um, I'm, I hope that Kayla gave you, uh, whoever asked this question, plenty of ideas on what advocates can be targeting. Um, and uh, yes, just want to echo what Alyssa said about uh, checking out Jonathan's recent piece. It's a really great piece. So I encourage you to go on our website, calbudgetcenter.org, and you can find those resources. Okay. Um, I see a question about the windfall tax. So Kayla, this is probably a good one for you. Uh, last fall, the governor had proposed a windfall tax or price gouging penalty. Um, is that still happening? So good question. The, the, what was originally called a windfall tax uh, proposal has morphed into this price gouging penalty. So they're no longer calling it a tax. Um, the, the governor put out some language, um, earlier this, uh, earlier in December and, um, Senator Nancy Skinner is carrying a bill. Um, and there's, there's still some details to be worked out. 
Um, but it would basically uh, create a penalty on oil refiners that have um, uh, margins above a certain level. So, you know, it, it gets a little complicated. There are no further details about it in the governor's proposal. Um, so it's something that will continue to be addressed in the special session that the governor called um, and will be worked, worked out um, in the legislature. Great, thank you so much, Kayla, for explaining that. Um, let's see, I do see a question on, are there any proposed investments in childcare and or direct care workforces for career pathways and or increased wages? I don't think we saw any of that in this budget. Um, we did lose our analyst who was very uh, attentive to this issue recently, unfortunately. But um, in the childcare space, I mentioned earlier that there's, um, you know, childcare providers are, of course, overdue for, for increases in rates. And we didn't really see any, any investments in that space at this time. Great. Thank you so much. Um, let's see. So paying attention to time, there was a question that I did want to make sure to ask. Uh, when can we expect to have a clear outlook on state revenues? I can take that one. So typically the administration has a much better sense of state revenues by the time that they're um, putting together the revised budget, which comes out in mid-May. And that's because most Californians file their taxes by the April 15th filing deadline. So there's a, a clear picture on um, personal income tax revenues. Um, there's also business taxes that come that they have a deadline in the spring. Um, but this year, the administration may not have as clear a picture as, as they typically do on state revenues because California has extended the tax filing deadline um, to May 15th. That's both for businesses and for individuals. Um, and that's because the IRS also extended the tax filing deadline um, in recognition that many people have been hit hard by the, the recent winter storms. Um, so while this is good for, for individuals and for businesses, it will make budgeting more difficult this year um, because the governor is going to have to put together a revised budget um, without as up-to-date information on state revenues as um, he would typically have. Great. Thank you so much, Alyssa. Uh, I do see. I was, oh, sorry. Go sorry. ahead, Kayla. I was just going to jump in there. So I believe that the tax extension is only in counties, certain counties that were an emergency declaration um, has been declared. But I mean, we know that it was a ton of counties that have emergency declarations for this, this, uh, these storms. So it's, yeah, what Alyssa said, it's going to be a very difficult year to, to be forecasting revenues accurately. Yes, great. Thank you so much. And kind of staying on that topic of revenues, uh, over the last few budget cycles, there were a lot of concerns about the GAN limit, um, a constitutional spending cap. Uh, why aren't we hearing about that now? Do we still need to worry about the GAN limit? I can jump in there again. So because the revenues have decreased, um, and you know, revenue estimates are down. The GAN limit doesn't seem like it's gonna be as big of an issue this year. Um, currently the, the governor's office is estimating that the state would be about $15 billion below the, the limit for um, the upcoming fiscal year, about $14 billion under the limit for the current fiscal year. So um, it's, it's, not, it's unlikely to create major budgeting challenges this year. But it's not going away. <laughs> it's in the Constitution. And when revenues start looking up again, as they inevitably will, the limit will again show, uh, pose challenges for budgeting by requiring that revenues over that limit are spent in specific ways. And eventually that could lead to cuts to, to core services. So again, this issue is not going away unless voters approve a change to the Constitution to either reform or eliminate it. Great, thank you so much, Kayla, on the refresher on the GAN limit. 
Uh, just echoing what she said, it's an issue that's not going to go away, even though we're not necessarily worried too much about it uh, in the short term. Okay, so um, just being mindful of time, we do have question or we do have time for one more question. Um, this is for anybody who would like to uh, chime in. What are the next steps in the budget that advocates can engage in? Are hearings set? I can jump in. Yeah, I mean, so the next step is to engage um, with those hearings that the legislature will start. Um, I at least the hearings that I tend to track, um, the schedule for them are not they're not out yet. Um, so I don't know if that's the case across all budget subcommittees, but I'm assuming that should be posted in the in the near term. Um, you can always reach out to um, specific committee staff to to find out. Um, when you know what if they know yet when the hearings are going to be um and you can check on on the assembly and the senate website as well but uh, you want to follow those hearings you want to show up you can give public comment and weigh in and, and give your perspective um, on the budget choices that are going to be made Great. Thank you so much, Alyssa. And then one point that I'd like to raise since we haven't already done so is that um, even though this year is is a challenging year, um, I, I guess our team would like to just encourage people to not be so discouraged because if you don't, you know, get anything that you don't ask, you can't get anything that you won't ask for. Um, but I'll, at the same time, we also need to prepare uh, to protect and avoid cuts in the event that the um, economic outlook does worsen. So I just want to leave you all with that um, point as we wrap up. Um, okay, and so looking at time, I just want to thank all of my colleagues for providing information uh, and details about the proposed budget and for answering questions. If we weren't able to get to your question, please feel free to reach out to us. Um, our contact information is on our website, calbudgetcenter.org, and uh, we really do appreciate um, engaging with you all. And if we're not able to answer uh, questions um, that you may have, we may be able to connect you with someone who can. Um, so we, we definitely um, love to be helpful and resourceful. And um, with that, I will go ahead and wrap things up. Thank you again. That was a lot of information, but I think um, as Adriana said, sort of the main takeaway from the webinar that I got was really there's a lot of tools that state leaders can take to invest in the millions of Californians who really need the help and support and services um, to get us through this hardship. So I just wanna say and echo what Adriana said, thank you to all of my colleagues for your wonderful presentation. Thank you to Adriana for your great moderating. And also thank you to our Budget Center team for their support in making this event happen. Oh my gosh, I took myself off. Um, <laughs> sorry, technical difficulties. But um, to close us off, I want to say to you, the audience, that I hope you got a lot of information from this webinar that will help you in your in advancing your budget and policy asks in the coming year. Again, as, as Adriana mentioned, we couldn't get to all of your questions, but we really encourage you to reach out to us at the Budget Center for any follow-up questions on the budget. At the same time, I also want to encourage you to go on our website and access our first look publication for a lot of information and details on the budget, as well as all of our other resources that my colleagues have shared with you all. At the same time, while you're on our website, I really wanna encourage you to sign up, if you haven't already, for budget center updates for timely and relevant reports around the ongoing budget proposals. As Alyssa had said, um, the recently, you know, the proposed budget for January marks a major milestone in the budget cycle, and we can expect in the coming months, continued budget negotiations, both behind the scenes and in legislative budget committees. These will probably be happening maybe in February and March. I actually don't want to say that because I don't know the dates either, but they will be happening and lead up to the May revised dropping in mid-May where um, 
where it needs to be finalized before mid-June. Of course, during that time as well, you can expect the Budget Center to release our analysis of the May revise. So I hope that I can welcome you to our power event around that topic. So before I sign us off, I do want to do a little bit of a plug because we have a little bit of time. Um, and I want to uplift our upcoming Policy Insights Conference that is happening in person in Sacramento this year on April 25th. This is an event that brings together the California Policy Committee, uh, sorry, Policy Community to strategize pathways for a more inclusive California. Early bird tickets end this month. 